Hello, my friend, and welcome to this two-part series on a call to leadership. I'm Dr. Nate Sala, your host. I am so glad you are here. If you're a father and you've had trouble in the space of dadding, and I know I have, whether it's been through the trials we've faced as parents or the trials we've faced as children of parents, this episode will be life-giving. I've invited a dear friend of mine, Mr. Scott Reed, who has recently written a book called The Power of a Dad. And it is so encouraging, inspiring, deep with wisdom. He's going to share some of his principles that have guided him in this world and continue to help men, fathers, become the dad that they are called to be. Can't wait for you to listen in. This is a call to leadership. Scott Reed, welcome to the show. Thanks, Nate. So, so good, good to see. be here, man. So We've been trying see. this for a while. I know. Here been we are. This for a while. And I'm just, I'm thrilled. And not only that, because you're just such an important person in this world. And I know that you probably, there being a being a, an introvert slash someone who doesn't like a lot of attention, <laughs> uh, it, it, it probably comes with a little bit of trepidation. However, mm -hmm. Our conversations often revolve around life and family and, and your mm -hmm. your involvement deeply in that space. And you mm -hmm. wrote this super cool book yeah. that we have to talk about because it, you know our listener knows uh, that that the the role of the father mm -hmm. is is essential. And yeah. uh, we we've we've in our society uh, we've fallen so far away from the the model uh, mm -hmm. for, for what a dad is. And you mm -hmm. speak to that directly, uh, not only in your book, but also in your life. And man, mm -hmm. I'd love to just take some time to unpack some of those principles and, and just some real valuable, uh, just, just takeaways for, for yeah. the dad who perhaps is struggling to get past uh, some challenges with a, with a yeah. son or a daughter, or perhaps the dad who's trying to identify what, what is a dad today? What, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do? Or perhaps mm -hmm. it's it's the dad who didn't have a dad uh, yeah. and trying to understand, like, how do I break this generational sort of curse, if we're going to use that terminology? Sure. Um, yeah. But before we get into that, man, what, I mean, okay, you got a book. <laughs> what what brought this on? Yeah. Uh, well, a couple of things. One, I think that's, I think it's been in me and on my heart for maybe, I don't know, my, most of my life, honestly. I think that, and we can talk more about this in a second, but just that calling of dad. And I think there's so much to being a good dad, but I think so much of it is in the DNA of every good man. It's the, it's the desire to serve. It's a desire to solve problems. It's a desire to fix things. It's a desire to like... Uh, build people up and cheer people on and coach people to victory. It's like, I think in a, in a healthy man, I truly believe in the heart of a healthy man, it's in all of us. So I think it's been there a long time. Um, but uh, for, for at least 15, 20 years, the majority of our marriage, I would say often to Holly, and I talked about this in the introduction of the book a little bit, I would often say to Holly, like, man, if I were to ever write a book, it would be about this thing. Now, I would say that because I knew in my, I knew I'd never write a book. So I, it's easy to say stuff like that. Um, so I'd be like, if I ever wrote a book, it would be about this. And then I would go on to tell some story that I just heard or uh, point to the TV and a news article that was, or a news story that was flashing up there. And it was always around, centered around uh, a, a son or a daughter who um, was either uh, had been either beautifully built up or unbelievably torn down by the by the dad or the lack thereof dad. Uh, and that's for, there's lots of reasons for that. But it's it's either an abusive dad, uh, a not present dad or a dad that's there and yet is always busy and doesn't know how to, you know, engage. But all over media. Uh, I would get I would get so frustrated with 90s TV sitcoms, you know, that were like making out the dad like everybody loves Raymond to just be this blithering idiot. And it's almost like, look, 
it, we would actually rather you stay out of this because you're just going to mess it up even more, right? And that just became the normal thing that we all bought as um, as a, an American culture specifically. But um, the other reason I think we that I wrote this book is that for the first time in my life, after uh, 23 years in full or 22 years, almost 23 in full time ministry, we moved to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, the Lord kind of called us to a, a, a something brand new that was pretty scary and pretty out there. And for the first time in my life, I had some margin uh, <laughs> to, to sit and like start this thing. Because as you know, you've written books, as you know, this, I don't know how people write books that have full time jobs, you know. So uh, it was I was able to finally sit down and get after this thing. And so that's probably the a long answer to the why. And, and, I, and I'm so thankful that you did. And, and we'll make sure that the show notes uh, show how to, how to get this uh, very important book. You mentioned something that I want to kind of frame around because I think it, it hits home for many of us, especially the middle-aged dad. You know, growing up in the 90s, so to speak, right? This, I mean, for those of us born in the 70s or the, or the early 80s, we remember shows like uh, Married with Children, and shows that really reflected the dad as a little bit of a buffoon, uh, someone yeah. who is out of touch and and uh, kind of the, the 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 joke of the family. Yeah, and you're right. This is a this is a common sort of theme. Uh, whereas you think about like the '60s dad, right? The the Leave It to Beaver dad and the the strong dad who has wise words, and um, that dad seemed to have disappeared in a lot of ways mm. in our, in our modern culture. And, mm. uh, and it, it, it kind of left like, Oh, you know, what is our, it's interesting you bring that up because our, you know, our influences, our media influences certainly do influence culture mm -hmm. and what we see around us. Uh, and I, and I wonder, you know, how that's affected dad's identities uh, in, in culture today uh, versus, versus those, those examples we had. Um, in in the earlier years of, of our television, yeah. And I wonder, do, do you do you do you see? I mean, you've been you know in, in the pastoral work for for many years, and you see, you've seen probably more dads than a lot of people will see uh, in terms of how they how they are interacting with their families mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. these children are raised and things like that. Yeah. And through your observations, how has that? inform some of your, uh, some of what you put into your book? Yeah, I, boy, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, Cause you're right. I, I've seen so many dads with so many different backgrounds um, and understandings. Um, I, I think the, I think the major influence into the book from what I've watched from most dads is that um, whether they are, feel equipped, maybe they had a good dad with, and good examples in their lives or not, there's this trepidation we all feel based upon our own insecurity, our own pride, our own, like uh, all of us struggle, all of us men struggle with not feeling like we're good enough. And I talk a bit about like the, 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 that famous John Eldridge uh, quote from wild at heart which is every man is asking the question do i have what it takes do i have what it takes am i strong enough right we we as men and dads we ask that question forevermore right uh and so i think uh, a lot of the impetus of this book was i want to say to all dads that have a level of health and i make sure i caveat that there's some dads that need to get healthy before they start pouring into people because we don't need uh, unhealthy, uh, toxic dads uh, pouring toxicity into sons and daughters, right? But for the most part, dads that have a level of health um, and a level of uh, maturity, there is such an opportunity all around them uh, to pour into sons and daughters with the heart of a good dad. There are sons and daughters everywhere. We see it in Los Angeles constantly. These young men and women, they don't even realize what they're missing uh, until they experience a healthy mom, healthy dad, healthy family. And then they go, whoa, uh, wow, I've been missing that. Um, and so I guess to answer your question, I think why me talking to so many dads along the way is I think all dads need a little bit of a, a little bit of a kick. Like, Hey, you got a lot to offer. Yeah. This world needs you. 
Um, not just your own biological kids. Maybe your biological kids are grown and gone and you're kind of an old man now and you feel like, what does anybody want to hear from me? We need your voice. We need what you have to say. You speak with a unique voice that mom can't speak with. You you have a unique power. And so uh, the 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 book was meant to like kick dads in the pants and say, we need to get, get it back in the game. Stop being sidelined, you know, bro. And I'm going to read an excerpt from your book that speaks to that on page 33. I love how you, you wrote this. You said this quote, being a dad and carrying a dad heart for those of us it is a life changing opportunity to which God is asking us men to say yes. Yeah. Tell me about the dad heart. Oof. Um, the dad heart is a is a is a deep well. But I I would say that that the uh, I, I think the most powerful thing in the heart of a dad is around this idea of identity. And I talk about um, I talk about one of the most powerful dad moments we see for sure in scripture. So I would. Uh, because uh, I'm a, you know, I, an apologetic uh, believer and follower of Jesus Christ. But so I would say that, that this, because of this, this is the most powerful dad moment of all time. Um, but when Jesus comes out of the water after being baptized, it's in Matthew 3, and and um, the heavens open, and everyone that's there, see, like, this is a factual event, uh, because so, so hundreds of eyewitnesses, the heavens opened, uh, a dove descended, uh, the, the spirit of God descended like a dove and a voice from heaven. I mean, imagine that again, hundreds of witnesses, a voice from heaven audibly speaks. And he says, this is my son whom I love in him. I'm well pleased. And so I talk about that phrase. This is my son or daughter whom I love. And in them, I'm really pleased. And the power of that from a dad, it, it speaks confirmation of identity and then it also speaks affirmation of identity. Not that we just love our kids, but we really like them and we're really cheering them on. We really see great stuff in them. Um, I think dad voice more than any voice in the, in the nuclear family unit has an ability to speak and to call out identity in sons and daughters. And if we look around our world today, and I know our viewers probably have come from very various views on this. And so uh, agree or not, it's okay. Uh, I'm just going to say my opinion. But we look around our world today, man, and I think so many of the problems that we see in our culture is are because of uh, confused identity. Whether it's whether it's identity in terms of role, you know, identity in terms of who we who we really are, identity in terms of sexuality. Like there's so many confused ideas about who we really are. And if Jesus needed to hear specifically from his dad, who he really was, uh, because he immediately went from baptism into the wilderness where the enemy, what the enemy was trying to get at the most with Jesus was, hey, if you really are who you think you are or who he says you are, right? And our, our whole lives are spent with the enemy attacking that same thing in us. Do you, are you really who you think you are, you, you don't really think you're all that, do you, right? Our culture is bombarded against our identity. And I think dad voices more than anything else are needed to speak who our kids, our sons and daughters really, really are in their core of who they are. Yeah. Man, that's strong. And it reminds me that our children are not the enemy. Mm. <laughs> you know, because mm. you've had teenagers and <laughs> there, it's, it's, it's easy to get caught up in what happened to my child that was so mm. loving and just like daddy's mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. They begin to form an identity and there's tension. There can be tension, let's mm -hmm. say between, especially males, let's call it, you know, males, uh, yeah. male, male children and, and the husband and the father. Mm -hmm. And sometimes <clears throat> it's easy to be in the flesh and say, oh, you want to challenge me? Or, oh, yeah, this is my house. Oh, yeah. You know, and go down the list of of O's. But but what's what's beautiful about the the illustration in scripture is that there, there really was no challenging. Uh the, Jesus wasn't challenging the father. He mm -hmm. was he was simply fulfilling 
Mm. The will of the Father. And mm. he was doing it because he was in unity with the Father. And, I, and at, at times, I think we forget that in this world, when the enemy or the adversary, and I just talked about this on another episode, whether you believe in a, a, a real adversary called uh, Satan or the adversarial nature of culture, the point is the adversary is the one who gets between. It is the divider. Mm. And this division causes us to not be in unity as a family. And, and, yeah. and, we're, and we're, where this scripture is, is that God is saying we are complete unity here. Mm -hmm. And I've found that in my own walk as a father, I have to check myself and thank God for a spouse who is infinitely more wisdom than, <laughs> than I am in this space with, True. with, 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 you know, with, with those aspects of, of her femininity that, mm -hmm. that I must consider in my own sort of um, natural masculinity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and just, just the other day. My son and I were having some, you know, just a little friction, guy friction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I was wrestling with how to, uh, you know, how to deal with this. And mm -hmm. and uh, she he, she had given him a hug, and she kind of just just did a little a little uh, hand gesture for those listening, not seeing the 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 social media, YouTube. Just come in, come in for the hug. Yeah, and I came yeah. in for the hug, and. It was uh, it was a bond, you know, mm -hmm. and we and and we we bonded and connected, and mm -hmm. it was a moment that brought us back together mm -hmm. when we were separated. Yeah, yeah. By the world, by by yeah. by by life, by whatever it is, man. And sometimes I had to actually. I watched a movie, and sometimes you. And I want to hear your opinion about this. Sometimes our head's not in the right space and our heart's not in the right space. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, our hands are definitely not going to be in the right space, right? And our, mm -hmm. our actions. So I watched, I don't know if you ever saw this movie yesterday. It was uh, the Beatles. Uh, it's a Beatles sort of oh. uh, movie with, a, anyway, I don't want to give it all away, but it's, it's, a, it's a love story. It's a, it's a love story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very touching story, but I, I watched parts of it to, to bring my, myself into a space that was more receptive of the care that's necessary and mm -hmm. not the, the uh, conflict that we sometimes yeah. will gravitate toward when we feel that there's a competition. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have a, it, so yeah. Um, is it, can I talk to that? Cause I yes. love that. I love how I, I have two real strong thoughts about what you just said. Um, one of the things is, is this Malachi 4 thing that I write at the very end of the book. I call it the turning, this chapter. And it's it's Malachi 4 saying that God will send Elijah who will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. So reconciliation of fathers to children is the heart of God. He 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 knows that's the game. That's the whole game of the enemy is to pull apart the unity of the family, specifically hearts of fathers to their children. Um, it, I mean, if you want to, if you want to know my, my belief so strongly is that the family unit is the catalyst for wholeness and health in our world. You want to see our culture improve. It's not going to be about who's president. It's not going to be about government. It's going to have nothing to do with policy. It's going to be you. You you get the the family healthy again, and you'll see culture improve. Period. I will stake my whole life on that. Um, so God's role, God's true plan, and His desire is for the hearts of fathers and children to be turned back together. Now, what you're you're talking about is really interesting. Where the the times we go into our kids and or we're trying to connect with our kids and they're not giving us anything or they're giving us lip or they're giving us attitude or they're giving us the opposite of connection. And it's frustrating and it's uh, it makes us want to pull away. And so one of the things I wrote in there, uh, which I, I try to live by and, and please know I was writing this book for me too, as a dad, there's no expert dad. I am not an expert dad. Daddy, dadding is hard. <laughs> Amen. Um, but uh, but one of the things I wrote is there's a big difference between a covenant and a promise, right? And so 
um, people think there may be the, the same things. And there's elements that are similar, but a covenant is is multiple parties, two or more parties that come together around an agreement and both sides, all sides have obligations and responsibilities to uphold to make this thing happen. When you married your wife, you and Tara got married, it, you both made obligations and promises to each other that that caused this covenant to happen with the Lord, right? A promise is very different. So when we read about God's promises to us, this is him making the, this is unilateral. When he promises Nate something, it has nothing to do with your behavior. You could, you could run away from him and he would still fulfill that promise in your life. That's the beautiful thing about who Jesus is and, and who the father is. Um, but we as dads, dude, here's the hard thing. This is the hard thing. We as dads made a promise to our kids. That was not a covenant, right? So my sons did not promise me anything when they were born. This was, this was not their choice. They, they, they got thrust into this world, into this family unit, into this life, not even by their own decision, right? I made the promise to this, these sons. So it is my responsibility to fulfill the promise I made to do my very best to be present, to love unconditionally, to give generously, to lay my life down for this for this son or daughter. Not, and it has nothing to do with their behavior. That's the hard thing. It has nothing to do with what they either, if they're, we all want them to be like, dad, you're the best. Well, you're so loving. You're so caring. You're so caring. Even without that, it's still our promise to keep. And that's a tough assignment. It's a tough Amen. assignment. And, and, you know, that ties into, I love it. That ties into grace, unmerited favor. And yeah, man. if we, if we haven't fully received grace, how can we fully extend it? If we haven't Good. fully received love, how can we fully turn around and give it? Man, yeah, that's, man. The, that's, that's the source. And I know this isn't necessarily, you know, sermon Wednesday, but you know, we have to figure out, we have to identify, understand what our sources are for that life giving promise to be fulfilling and to truly mm -hmm. fulfill it. Boy, that's, that's a, that's a big question. And I, I'd like to, I'd like to actually turn, turn the page to that because mm -hmm. I think it's important to have the conversation. It's important to have the conversation around what we are, are surrounding ourselves with so that we can create an environment for ourselves that gives life to our families. And, and I say that to say when, you know, you and I have been, been friends for gosh, almost two decades now. And so you were about five mm -hmm. years ahead of me on the father, on the father circuit. And so, you know, when you're, uh, when your kids were young, I, I was learning, oh, okay, well, here's, you know, here's some of the things you say or do, but you say you, you would, you had these phrases. One of the phrases I remember to this day, obedience first. I don't know if you remember that, but Ooh, yeah. you, would, you would tell me that. And I'm like, what, what a great phrase. In other words, <laughs> when they're little, let's rather than explain what all of the different aspects of what we're going to do, let's work through learning to be obedient Mm -hmm. And then having a trust in your father that I will mm -hmm. then reveal to you the why. Yeah. I found that to be instrumental in those early years. Now, things change, of course. Now sure. it's uh, with, with adolescents and teens, of course, and then ad adult children, things change, of course, different seasons. Mm -hmm. I say that to say uh, mentorship uh, in, in, in this space of fatherhood. How, how important is that? And, and how do we mm. manifest it? Wow. Yeah. Mentorship to, uh, to our sons. Um, I, I think it, there are, unfortunately, there are, I think, I think a lot of dads that do that obedience first. And, and to, to just explain more ab about what I used to tell you. And I, I actually wrote about that in the raising chapter of this book too, but that, uh, we were we were the kind of parents, and thankfully Holly and I had unity. I know there's a lot of parents out there that do not agree on how to raise kids, and that is an extremely difficult place. Uh, and I have a lot of compassion for parents that don't agree. 
thankfully Holly and I had a lot of unity and we would just say to the boys, when we'd ask them to do something that they didn't understand and they wanted to talk about it or argue or push back, we would simply say, here's what I need you to do. I, I want you to obey and do it. And then we'll talk about it. Then we'll talk about it. Um, and um, when it comes to the, this I idea of mentorship, it's all, this is a whole nother thing, a whole nother level of, of that. Uh, unfortunately, there are the dads that demand obedience and demand respect. Um, and yet we all are hypocrites on some level. Uh, we, we all uh, we all have things that we uh, say we are and we don't actually totally fulfill. Um, so it's in all of us. Uh, but dads will demand respect, demand obedience, and, and yet they do not live in a way um, that the, that their sons and daughters can grow up watching and saying, boy, I, I want to be like my dad in that area, or I wish I was more like him in this or that. Wow, indeed. To get that response from our children, particularly in areas where we are leading healthily and wholly and with great wisdom and gratitude, and as we round out this first half, I am so thankful that you joined Scott and myself as we unpack this conversation so timely, so needed about, I can't wait for you to listen to the second part of this episode in just one week as we go deeper and further with mentorship and the busy dad unpacking that with some sage wisdom from Scott and his book, The Power of a Dad. Can't wait for you to listen in. I'm Dr. Nate Sala. <laughs>